Okay, welcome to our first lesson of geometry, which is points, lines, and planes. This is 1-2, we're skipping 1-1, jumping right into it. And what we're establishing here are the very building blocks of geometry. And we're gonna try to understand the basic terms and postulates of geometry. You'll find out what postulates are in just a moment. Now, just as a little thought experiment to warm up, if you took a piece of paper and put a pencil through it, like you see this figure at the right, uh, is it possible to do this with a solid board or a flat piece of paper and a pencil? And you might have an intuitive sense of this. Our little textbook character asks, does how the arrow goes through the board make sense? And again, you have an, maybe an intuitive sense of it, but you're going to get a better understanding of the rules that govern this. But take a look at that for a second and see what you think before you move on. Now, the whole basis of geometry is it is a mathematical system that's built on accepted facts, things that we agree to be true and all understand to be true, and also basic terms and the definitions for those terms. The facts we will demonstrate to be true so you don't just have to take it on faith. Um, now, in geometry, some words such as point, line, and plane are undefined. This means something specific. Undefined terms are basic ideas you can use to build the definitions of other figures in geometry. Um, we're going to describe everything in terms of points, lines and planes, and then the things that we can describe using points, lines, and planes, we can then also use to describe newer things, okay? Uh, although you can't define these undefined terms because we don't have some uh, basis uh, of terms that we already know to start with, it's important to have a general description of them. So here they are. Point, this is a location in space. Uh, oops. and it has no size, okay? You could keep zooming in on a single point and what you're really doing is, is getting closer and closer to the very exact, exact location. You think of a molecule and then even smaller, okay? You can re represent it by a point and you name it with a capital letter. The way that we name it is important so that we can uh, know what we're seeing when we have diagrams such as these, okay? A line is represented by a straight path, the shortest distance that extends in two opposite directions without end, never ending. You can imagine if you could shoot a bullet that went in both directions at the same time for forever, that path uh, would be a line. Now, I'll talk about that in a little bit further when we have newer definitions. Uh, no thickness, okay? It is simply an infinite series of infinitely small points um, all stretching out in a straight path. A line has infinitely many points, okay? Um, and now you name any line by two of the points on that line, such as A and B, and you have this little arrow, and you can see on top the arrow um, goes in both directions forever. There's a point on each side that goes both directions, and you read that as line AB. You could also say line BA because there's no preferred end point because there are no end points, okay? Um, sometimes lines are named with a lowercase letter, such as line L in this case, okay? But if you name it with two points, the, each point is a capitalized letter, just like up here, and you have to define it as being an actual line by an arrow on both sides. And you have to read it as line AB, not just say AB, okay? And we'll see what we're trying to differentiate it from later. Now, a plane, and you can get this intuitively, is represented by a flat surface that extends without end, and it has no thickness. A plane is the width of a line, which has no thickness, uh, and the width of a point, which has no thickness, okay? So the plane contains infinitely many lines and, of course, infinitely many points, but it's all a flat surface. You can think of a, a tabletop. You can think of the wall or the ceiling of your room, um, perfectly flat, okay? Now you name a plane by a, either a capital letter such as P, you notice that this P has no point associated with it, so that becomes the name of the plane, or at least 
three points on the plane, okay? And we will demonstrate why it has to be three. And um, points that don't all lie, lie on the same line, because if they all are on the same line, that doesn't uniquely describe a particular plane, and we'll demonstrate that. Okay, so this slide here is just showing some vocabulary. You can pause it and write this down. If you are a lifelong learner, someone who just wants to become better at learning and better at academic study, then you should make a section in your notebook to record this vocabulary. And then when you encounter each uh, word in the reading and find its definition, you can write the definition beside the word in that section of your notebook. That's what lifelong learners do. And that is a really good habit to get into. So if you want to, you can pause the video now to record these. I highly suggest it. Um, just a note here, you'll see this font that I'm using. It seems kind of unusual. Um, this is a dyslexia font. It's supposed to be helpful for people with this dyslexia. So if uh, people that have problems visual, uh, keeping the visual uh, letters and words kind of clear in their in their visual field, um, the the particular font is supposedly helpful for them. So I'm going to use it. I'm sorry if uh, if you uh, it's awkward to you now, but you'll get used to it. But for anyone that needs it, it's going to be really hopefully helpful. So that's why I'll be using this font. Okay, so we're going to apply some of the understanding that we know we have already. Um, points that lie on the same line are collinear points. And I'm just going to draw a line down here on the bottom. And you can imagine that if you had a point here and a point here, those two points obviously fall on a line because you can just connect them and make the line that they're on. But does a third point also fall on it? This point is not on that line, so that point is not collinear with the other two points. But this point does fall on the same line as the other two points. And if you connected two of the points, you'd go through the third point. So those three lines are, or those three points rather, are collinear, whereas this one is not. That's the idea of that. Um, we also have points and lines that are on the same plane are coplanar. Okay, all the points on some line are all going to be on the same plane because that line is going to land on some flat surface or some flat plane. And uh, an important distinction here is that you, in your, if you can imagine this, um, in your room, you have a floor, you have a ceiling, you have your four walls. Those are all planes, but those are not the only planes that are technically uh, or possibly in your room. You could draw a flat surface at an angle, like the surface of your laptop uh, screen when it's kind of tilted. That's going to define part of a plane. They'll, all of the points that are on your laptop uh, screen will be, if you put points on them, they'll all be coplanar. If you drew lines on your screen, it'd be all coplanar. And that is not a wall or a ceiling or a floor of your room, but that is like a plane that would, in theory, cut through the universe infinitely in all directions. That one slice through everything that would go along the path of your laptop screen, okay? Um, now, let's do a problem. Naming points, lines, and planes. What are two other ways to name line QT? Well, QT is this line that runs right here. Okay, you see Q and you see T, and this dot, dot, dot means it's running, it's cutting into the, poking through the paper, and now it's behind it right there. Okay, what other ways that you can name it? Um, Well, two other ways to name QT are T, line TQ, and that's just reversing the order of the letters. So that's like a, a different name, but it's the same line. Or you could call it line M because M is the small letter down here that's describing that line. You notice that N is also on this point. So even though they didn't say it, you could also name this line as line TN. I'm trying to get my pencil to work better line TN, and we got to put the arrows on both sides, uh, or line NT. Uh, we could also use Q and N, so we could call it line QN and line NQ. Those are all different names for the same line. Since we have three points, we can pick any two points and write them in any two order. 
uh, you know, QN and Q, for example, and also with line M. So those are some other alternate names that you could uh, name that. Now, what are there, what are two ways to name plane P? Let's take a look at plane P. That is right here, right here. And we could name plane P, remember, with any three points that are on it. So two other ways you could name plane P are plane, and you'd write the word plane, there's no symbol for it, plane RQV, RQV, three points that are on it, or plane RSV, or any combination of it, right? You could call it plane um, V R S, which is these letters, but in a different order. Um, this is not a point, remember, that's just the name of the plane. But we can't name it, and see if you understand why, we cannot name it plane RQS. Do you know why? Right, because they cannot be collinear points, okay? They, if all three of these are on the same line, then there's another plane that also runs at a different angle through this line, but isn't this plane. Okay, so they have to be non-collinear. Non-collinear meaning not all on the same line. Okay? And lastly here, what are the names of three collinear points? Well, I just suggested that, right? And what are the names of four coplanar points? Well, three collinear points are three that are on the same line, R, Q, and S. They're collinear. We could also say N, Q, and T. Those are all falling on line M. Okay? And four coplanar points would be the four points that are on this plane, R, Q, S, and V. They're all coplanar, okay? Uh, and of course, configures have more than one name. Lines and planes are made up of many points, and you can choose any two points on a line to describe and name that line, and any three or, or more co non-collinear points on a plane for the same name. It says three or more because sometimes you'll see them using four different points to describe a plane, but let's try and keep it with three, because three is all you need, and that makes it the simplified way of doing it. So now it's the time to stop the video and solve these got it problems. Okay, so moving on. There's a lot of information in this video because we're establishing a lot of terms and ideas here. but. The terms point, line, and plane, which hopefully you have a general sense of what those are, they're not defined because their definitions would require terms that we don't have yet. Those are the starting points, okay? And they, those would also need defining, so. We can, however, use undefined terms to define other terms. Now, we're gonna use this point, line, and plane to make a description of some other terms that we will then know what they mean based on point, line, and plane. And then whatever we can come up with, we can use to define further terms. A geometric figure is a set of points. We can describe geometric figures, even, for example, a sphere as just an infinite series of points that are all equidistant from its center, for example. Now, space is the set of all points in three dimensions, length, width, and height, going on for forever, theoretically. And you should do a mind uh, experiment where you just sit and imagine something never, ever ending going on for years and years and years in the same direction and never ending, okay? Um, all of the points that you could possibly find, all of the locations in space, that whole set of points in three dimensions is what space is that we're talking about. The, all the possibility of all of the locations that a point could be in the universe, okay? Now similarly, the, segment, the def definitions for segment and ray are also based on this. So space we're defining as the set of all points in three dimensions, and that I, that definition is based on point, uh, segment, and ray. How do we use points and lines to define these new terms that we can then use further? Well, a segment is part of a line, okay, and it consists of two endpoints and all the points in between, whereas this line theoretically goes on for forever in both directions, forever, literally forever in theory, okay, a segment is just a portion of that where you have a start and an end. Or not really start and an end, but two end points because there's no starting point that's preferred. Either one you could start from and travel across to the end point and all the points in between. 
If you connect these two, A and B, all the points in between are also on this segment. You can name a segment by its two endpoints, such as segment AB, and see there's no arrows on either end? That means we know it's a segment. It ends at both ends. Red as segment AB, or we could call it segment BA. And I want you to say segment. I want you to say line. I don't want you to just say AB without telling what type of figure it is. Now, array is part of a line that does have one endpoint. It consists of an endpoint and all of the points on the line on one side of it. So in this case, we start at point A. That's the, the one endpoint we do have. And if we travel from A through B and onward for forever, we are following the path of this ray. And notice how we name it. You can name a ray by its endpoint and another point on the ray, such as this point B. So we can call this ray AB. The order of the points indicates the ray's direction. Notice that we're always pointing to the right. The arrow is always to the right. And whatever is the endpoint, A is the endpoint, will be at that front side where there is no arrow saying it doesn't continue in that direction past A. So we will call this ray AB, where A is the endpoint, and we're always pointing it to the right through some other second point. Okay? Now, and you can think of the rays of, of the sun, right? It leaves the sun, the sun is the endpoint, and it goes for forever, theoretically, in one direction. Now, opposite rays are two rays that share the same endpoint and form a line. So here we've got endpoint C, and going from C, you go through A infinitely forever. And from C in the other exact opposite direction, you go from C through B, on for forever. Now, connecting A and B in a line will create the path that makes the line that these two opposite rays make. So opposite, exactly opposite rays will have this common endpoint and all of the points along them will fall on a single line. So you can name the opposite rays by their shared endpoint and any other point on the rays, such as this one is, starts at C, the endpoint, so that's the first letter, running through A ray C A. Okay, arrow always points to the right. And starts at C, runs through B. This arrow always points to the right, C B. So do not write this because this is not how we do it. You don't write ray A C and since C is the endpoint, we put the endpoint there, no arrow, and point it this way. We're always going to point it to the right, then the first letter is going to be the endpoint. Got it? That matters. That's how we're going to be doing it. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so here we are naming the ray, uh, segments and rays, and problem 2A here says, what are the names of the segments in the figure at the right? Um, now, something to consider is that if you start at an endpoint for um, a segment, you need to have another endpoint on the other side. So if we start at D here, we could go from D to E, or we can go from D to F, right? Um, now, D, E could be also called E, D. Here to here, here to here. That's the same set of points, okay? You could also go E, F here, or F, E is the, another name for the same segment. And D, F or F, D, you can go the entire length from this point all the way to this point, D, F or F, D, yeah? And so we call that segment DE or segment ED. Same one. So if you're asked to name unique segments, writing this twice isn't helpful because you're still talking about just the same thing. Okay. Um, now, what are the names of the rays? For the rays, if we have this as an endpoint, we certainly can't go this direction because there's no named point in this direction. This is a ray, but we don't have a name for it because we need to have another named point that way. So we're not going to be able to name it. So we could start at D and go through E. And starting at D and going through E is the same as starting at D and going through F. As long as you name some other point on the ray after the end point, it's the same ray. So DE, ray DE, or ray DF, same ray. Okay, we could start at E and go from E through D, ray ED, or ray EF. Notice that we both start at the end point as the first letter, and the arrow always points to the right. Um, or we could have end point F 
in which case you can't go this way because there's no second point to name. We could go from F through E or from F through D. So ray F D or ray F E. Okay. Um, how do you know you, how do you make sure you name all the rays? Each point on the line is an endpoint for a ray. At each point, follow the line both left and right and see if you can find a second point. And like I said, here at D, you couldn't go this way to find a second point, but here you can. D to E, so ray D E, ray D F is the same. Okay. Which of the rays in part B are opposite rays? Well, we have to go in both directions from an endpoint to name opposite rays. We can't go this way to name it, so that's not going to be possible to have opposite rays from there. Same thing here. We won't start from F to get opposite rays because we don't have a second point to name. So we'd have to start at E, going through D, ray E D, and going in the opposite direction, ray E F. So rays E D and E F are opposite rays, meaning they're all on the same line, they have the same endpoint, and if you put the two of them together, you form a line with no space in between them and no overlap. Okay, now's the time to uh, try the got it problem, see how we did. So we'll stop and do this problem now, and then check our answers. Okay, so earlier you saw us refer to the term postulate, and a postulate, otherwise known as an axiom, is an accepted statement of facts. Um, you're going to see other things like theorems and such. They're, they have different names because we have different ways of reaching the conclusion that they're true, but we treat them as true all, and, and all the time if they fit the right uh, you know, situation. So postulates, like undefined terms, are basic building blocks of the logical system of geometry. We're going to use logic a lot. Logical reasoning, uh, we're going to prove a, a lot of the general concepts in this book by logic, and we're going to formally explore logic in Unit 2. Okay, so you've used some of the following geometry postulates in algebra. For example, you use postulate 1-1 when you graphed equations, equations such as y equals 2x plus 8. Postulate 1 1, we'll talk about in a second. Um, but what you did is you graphed two points and then you drew a line through those points because the postulate says through any two points there's exactly one line. So if we said we know there's a point here and we know there's a point here on the graph, then that's enough for us to be able to connect them and say that's the line because there's only exactly one line that runs through those two points. Um, you can describe it in di using different equations, but it's all a different way of naming or describing the exact same line. So line T is the only line that passes through both points A and B. You couldn't pass through A and B and not be exactly in the same place that T is at all places. Okay? So postulates are things that we're going to, rules that we're going to understand to be true and we treat them as fact. Okay. This is just defining the word intersection. When you have two or more geometric figures, their intersection, what we mean by that is that it is the set of points that the figures have in common. We could have a bunch of different types of geometric figures, and they'll have their intersections will, will be different sets of points, um, but that's what we mean when we say this word. Now, in algebra, one way to solve a system of two equations is to graph them. The graphs of these two lines are here, and they intersect at this single point, 3, 2. Okay? So the solution is 3, 2. That is the one place that is the intersection of both lines where that point is on both lines simultaneously. So postulate 1-2 says, if two distinct lines intersect, then they intersect at exactly one point. Okay? Um, and when we say two distinct lines, in Algebra 1, you learn that there's several possibilities. There's lines that are parallel, and they never intersect, which would not fit this because this supposes that they do. And if they intersect, they could be like this, where they intersect at all points. Okay, but then that's not two distinct lines. That's just the same line twice. Okay, so if they're two distinct lines and they inter intersect like they do here, we know that they intersect at exactly one point, and so for line AE and line DB, their point of intersection is point C. Okay, 
there's a similar postulate that describes the intersection of planes. If two distinct planes, they're not exactly the same thing twice, like two lines that are right on top of each other, um, but they're different planes and they intersect, then where they intersect will be a line, exactly one line. In this case, line ST is where planes uh, RST and WST intersect at line ST. Okay? And you can imagine that this blue plane goes infinitely in all directions forever. It doesn't end like this, uh, this rectangle does, but it actually theoretically keeps going, which means, and so does this yellow plane, keeps going, and so therefore the line also keeps going. It's not just the segment here from one end to the other, because the planes, this is a visual representation of a plane that infinitely goes on forever. And they obviously can't show that going on for forever, it's impossible. So they represent it like that. And we need to understand that this represents a plane that actually doesn't, isn't just a rectangle but goes on forever, and so, so is their uh, line of intersection, okay? Now, when you know two points, if I know that, uh, where, that the two planes have in common, I know the points S and T are both on this plane, uh, W, S, T, and they're on this plane, R, S, T, then those two points that the two planes have in common will be able to describe the line of intersection, okay? Postulates 1-1 and 1-3 tell you that the line through those points is the intersection of the planes. And we know that these two planes share two points because look, the names of the two uh, points, S and T, are in the names of both planes, S and T, okay? They both contain S, they both contain T, and since they contain S and T, two distinct points, you can connect them to make a line, and that line is their line of intersection. Now, just a little note, diagrams like the one above, they're excellent tools for visualizing a concept, so don't just glance at them, but really, really study them until you understand how this represents what concept is being discussed. This represents exactly this, and until you really get your mind around this showing that, you maybe aren't done looking at a diagram yet. So consider hanging around and continuing to examine a diagram until you see, oh, I see what's going on. I see how this is visually represented here. Okay, we're going to apply this idea to problem number three, finding the intersection of two planes. Uh, each surface of the box at the right here represents part of a plane. This right here, they're going to talk about plane ADC. This is part of a, the larger plane that would not stop at these edges, but continue going on through that plane, but also continuing like a flat surface that goes on forever, okay? And also plane B, F, G. B, F, G, these are all on this plane, okay? So you can imagine that as extending for forever, and they can pass through each other. They don't stop each other because they're imaginary, and you can imagine them as cutting through each other, no problem. So. What do we know? We know that the two planes that we're talking about are plane ADC and plane BGF, and we need to know the intersection of those two planes. So we're, how do two intersecting planes, uh, what do they form? What kind of geometric figure they form? Uh, remember from the last uh, postulate, we know that they form a line. So find the points in the plane that they have in common, and let's take a look at that. Doing that, we say there they are. We focus on plane ADC and we focus on plane BGF, see where they intersect, and where do they intersect? They intersect at uh, both points B and point C, okay? So that line BC is the line of intersection. The planes inter intersect at line BC, and make a note, it's not enough to call this BC, it must be spoken or pronounced or read as line BC. As you'll see, other objects can also have two letter names, such as rays or segments. So not enough to call it BC, you need to say the word line BC. All right, here's the got it problem for problem three. What are the names of two planes that intersect in line BF? You're going to identify the planes, and we will name three points on the plane, three non-collinear points on the plane that will uniquely name that plane. And also, part B, 
Why do you only need to find two common points to name the intersection of two distinct planes? We're going to stop now and work on this problem, and then we'll check our answers. Okay, so the idea here, photographers will use a tripod, exactly a three-legged uh, stand, because that's going to make the camera, camera extremely stable. There's going to be some single plane, in this case the floor, that the one, two, three points all rest on. Those one, two, three non-collinear points, they're not all on the same line, um, will rest all on a single plane. And so they will rest on the plane that, in that case, is the floor, okay? Now, if they are all on the same line, imagine taking this leg and putting it in line with this one. Now the whole thing could just tip forward because this isn't kind of sticking out to stop it. And you can imagine what I'm talking about there. If you put your two feet out and then you had a crutch and you lean, stuck the crutch out in front of you, you could keep yourself standing. But if you, the crutch was next to you and you leaned forward, you'd be able to fall over. Um, so the feet can't lie all on one line. They have to be non-collinear, okay? And that illustrates this next postulate, postulate 1-4. And what that says is, through any three non-collinear, not all on the same line, points, there's exactly one plane, okay? So we've got on plane P, there's no point attached to P, so that's the name of the plane. These three points, Q, R, and S, are not in a line, so they can uniquely describe that plane. And you could call that plane, plane R, S, Q. You could call it plane R, Q, S, plane Q, R, S, plane Q, SR, plane SRQ, and plane SQR are all other names for plane P. Okay, we're going to apply this idea here. Um, use the figure at the right, this figure right here. And you see all the points. Uh, this is point R down there in the corner. This is point J, K, Q, etc. all the corner points. Now, what plane contains points N, P, and Q? Shade the plane. Well, now you could call it plane and then name those three points as long as they were non-collinear. So we could call it plane NPQ, but where is it? Okay, it is this plane here on the bottom. It contains N, P, and Q, also R. Okay, um, so what plane is it? They're just saying it's the one on the bottom of the figure, but you could name it with three points, plane NPQ, if you like. Now, trickier is the question, what plane contains points J, M, and Q? Shade the plane. Well, J is here, M is here, Q is down here. M, J, and Q. Is it possible to have a plane that contains M and J and Q? Well, you might say no because you don't see any of the sides of the box. Um, containing all three of those points simultaneously. But what you're maybe forgetting, because you're new at this, is this idea that there is invisible planes running everywhere through all points. Even if you don't see them carved out, they are there. And any three points that aren't in a line will uniquely describe some plane. And in this case, there's a plane that runs here, through M and J and down through Q. And you can see it also runs, happens to run through P diagonally. Now, do you see that in the diagram up here? No, you don't, but planes are all around us. If you were an invisible universe-sized samurai slicing your sword, you could slice the universe into two equal parts, or I shouldn't say equal parts, but two distinct parts, and that perfect slice through the entire universe would be a plane, okay? And that could happen at any angle, anywhere to slice the universe up. And then that's what, in this case, is happening here, is the universe samurai is slicing this, in this case, this box, uh, at an angle, okay? There's a plane that runs through that, too. Here's the got a problem for this, number four. Uh, four A says, what plane contains points L, M, and N, copy the figure in problem four, 
in order to shade that plane. And then the reasoning question part B is what is the name of a line that is coplanar with line JK and KL? Uh, we're going to stop here and give it a try. Okay, these lesson check problems are a good way for you to know whether you got the main idea of the lesson. So take a look at them, write the answers down on our lesson pages. We have answers at the bottom uh, that you can compare your answer to to see if you got it right. Good luck.